The origin of the 40 part motet comes from when I was working in England on a project and one of the singers that I was working with recognized that I liked three-dimensional sound. She said, you have to listen to this. So when I went back to Canada, I put it into my CD player and I listened it. and it was the 40 part motet. And I knew that it was about 40 different singers creating this polyphonic piece of music. Right then I had a physical feeling I wanted to be inside the music. There are eight different choirs. They call them choirs, groupings of the singers. Every choir has bass, baritone, alto, tenor, soprano. And each, each speaker is a separate person singing, a man, a male voice coming out, except for the sopranos are um, boys and girls. The reason I wanted to work with it like this in, a, in an oval is that immediately I saw it as sculpture and I saw this piece of music as being a brilliant composition and I wanted to show how brilliant the composer was and show how it moved because um, I'm a bit synesthetic. I really wanted to feel the sound moving from one place to another place and to another place and to another place. And so when the viewer and listener comes into the space, I want them to, to realize that it's moving around them. It's not staying still, it's not overall. When I first went to the city, to university, I was just amazed at, like, I, I, I was overwhelmed with, with sound. And I think the sensitivity then got me into, I went through traditional fine art training, painting and printmaking and sculpture. But then when I started, um, uh, dating George Burs Miller and we started actually working together right from the beginning and he was much more into technology and and um, we got access to sound studios and all of a sudden then I started realizing that sound did exactly what I wanted. When I was working in printmaking and painting I was always trying to make many different panels or some sort of narrative going on or some sort of continue continuous sort of thought that dealt with memory in a particular way. Like sound, whether it's music or whether it's sound effects or narrative voice, you have to use your memory in a way that it disappears what you've just heard. I still, in, in my studio, I have tons of physical objects. I find lots of found objects and I put them together. I'm, I'm really, at my base is a collage artist too. So, and the way I approach sound is much, is very um, much about collage. And so in, in ways I, I see the audio in that kind of way, if you could have cubist audio, it's kind of doing that. It's taking sources from all over, like some of the, the soundtracks that we work with have recordings from, you know, 80 years ago or 50 years ago or 20 years ago, and then you're collaging them all together and making them into these um, collages of time and space. And uh, sound has that ability to come into your body without any, any defenses put up. When I was envisioning it, I envisioned that every person walking into the room would have a different interpretation of the music because of where they walked. There's no definitive a answer to the piece. And that people are making sculpture as they walk around. first three minutes of the piece, you hear, we call it the intermission, you hear people chatting, clearing their throat, saying, uh, you know, talking about the wires of the microphone. Um, it brings the singers into this personal, normal person, kind of like down to earth. And then you see the function of music, what happens when people come together and singing, and then it becomes something else.